welcome to Gardener's World. Now the Rising Garden, as we come into June, is at its frothiest best. I wanted, when I started to make this, to capture the spirit of cow parsley. I love the way that for a few weeks, the end of May, beginning of June, it flows and rolls along hedgerows and country lanes and floats and shimmies with these lovely, delicate white flowers. So that's what I've tried to achieve. And plants like Olea do this beautifully. And this particular allium, it's Mount Everest, has a slightly silvery, ghostly touch to it. I've used Silene, which can be a thug, but it is lovely while it lasts. This is always work in progress, but just for the moment, it's doing exactly what I want. Coming up on today's show, Carol and the team share the very best of the RHS Chatsworth Flower Show. Adam visits a street of exquisite but truly tiny front gardens in Peckham, South London. And I'll be planting out some tender veg. And tonight is the night when voting begins on our Every Space Counts competition. I'll be telling you exactly how you can do that later on. we had a really heavy snowfall and then it froze and the upshot was the weight of the snow split a weeping pair that we had here and when we cleared it up what was left didn't look very good so that was it we cut it down but now we've got more room and i can put in a really substantial plant in its place and have other plants around it now if you want a substantial plant few are bigger more dramatic than the Abyssinian banana Enceti morellii ventricosum, one of the grandest plants that any garden could ever grow. I'm going to prepare the ground before I try moving it. It means a little bit of collateral damage. That, I think, should do. so much goodness in the soil but if your soil is sandy or chalky or in any way light add plenty of garden compost or manure if you've got it both in the hole which will act as a sponge as much as anything else to hold moisture and to mulch all around it these plants will eat and drink anything and everything you give them they are voracious it's just make sure it's completely upright it will very quickly grow its roots out into the soil. As much as anything else, that will anchor it. My main worry for the next few weeks is if we get a storm, the whole thing can blow over. So I need to firm it in really well. And I'll know that it's happy when I start to see new leaves develop. And I would expect this to grow at least twice as big as this. It's a monster. And here in the jaw garden with its amazing burgundy colored stems that get burnished as they grow. It is an absolute star as well as being a really good foil and backdrop for the plants around it. The one thing I have to do and keep doing if it's at all dry is give it a good drink. Unless it rains fairly heavily, this will need a couple of cans of water at least weekly. And now that this is in the ground, it means that the door is open for all tender plants to come outside. So that's just the beginning. Whilst a huge banana plant is good fun and dramatic, there are lots of tender plants. Modest and cheap, especially if you grow them from seed. But it's a bit late now to sow from seed, but garden centers are full of them and you can buy them by the tray. Now, these are essentially tender bedding plants. So, you have a plant like this. This is Cosmos, Cosmos bipinatus purity. 
This can flower well into autumn. And if I just dot these in, what you end up with is a sort of flow and jumble of plants. Some hardy, some tender, but all perfectly happy with our summer climate. So that can go in there, and that will grow up that tall. Probably fit another one in front of here. If they're looking unnaturally tall without enough bushiness, the thing to do is to pinch out the top, and that will encourage the side shoots. And the side shoots will have more flowers. And as well as cosmos, every year I always sow sunflowers, zinnias. Summer really kicks in, but they will go on till the first frost, and then that's it. The key thing is that you create your garden as you want it. It must reflect your own idiosyncrasies and personal choices. Don't worry about what other people think. However, of course, there are gardens that are very public. We went down to Faversham in Kent to visit a garden by the side of a busy road looked after by a dedicated group of individuals with its own very special story. The rookery is called Abel's Acre. It's in Forbes Road, which is one of the main entrances into Faversham. Where the rookery is situated, it's pretty busy at times, this road. You're not expecting this amount of colour when you walk past. It just blows you over. It's just wow. I'm Sandra Todd. I'm 67 and I'm from Faversham, Kate. We have seven volunteers and we do, well, all types of gardening jobs. There's pruning. Weeding, planting, we do a bit of everything, I think. No, the orange flowers. You've got to deadhead them once. Okay, I'm, I'm Hazel Burford and I'm 69. And Abel's Acre was created by my dad, who's Mr. Walter Abel, and he worked for Faversham Council. I started working on Abel's Acre in the early 60s. It was my dad's idea, and he, he designed it all from scratch. He was very proud of the rockery. He used to tell Mum all the plants he planted that day and all the plants they're growing. Yeah, he did enjoy it. I remember as a teenager, I was on the bus. I remember the days being dull and damp and horrible and then you just saw this beautiful colour. It was outstanding. My dad left when he was 66, so he retired. And that's when the rockery went to wreck and ruin. I used to walk past and I kept thinking, oh, it looks horrible. I met Sandra and I spoke to Sandra about it and said how horrible it looks. She put this little idea in my head about bringing the rockery back. So I started writing letters to the council who own it. And uh, they were quite enthusiastic, I think, for us to do it. It took us three years altogether to clear it all from start to finish. There was needles up there, car engine, cl old clothes. It, it was a mess. When we started, there was mainly four of us. It was very hard work, but very enjoyable, very enjoyable. We did have a laugh, yes. People stop us all the time and uh, thank us, which is very, very nice. It, it's, it's just amazing how people just appreciate it and love it. My dad did love his garden. He's been gone since 94, but he would, he would love it now. We've got Acrylisia, and if you look closely at one, they look like Granny's bonnet. The California poppies I love, um, they're so bright, they're so in your face. They just keep coming back, and it's like old friend coming back. So I just love them. We've gone in for perennial plants, so 
it's a bit different coloured to what it was when my dad did it. My dad would be proud. Although we work on it, it's not our rockery. It's Favisham's rockery. It's surprising when you get together with people how you can change things. Comparing to where it was over 15 years ago now, to what it looks today, it looks absolutely brilliant. You can't describe it any other way. You've got to see it yourself. To my mind, there is absolutely no question that the secret of any garden, it doesn't matter how public it is, is personal love and dedication, and that certainly is a good example of that. Well, something I am loving in the garden at the moment are our bearded irises. There are three varieties. We've got deep black with its inky petals, the Sultan's Palace, which has got a reddish blush, and then finally, we've got Carnival Time, which is almost brown, flush with orange. And for the moment, they're adding that richness of colour that I absolutely love. At the beginning of April, I did as I always do, which is to take some dahlia cuttings. And it's a really effective way of getting... So I'll put them on just to grow them bigger. Now that one there, I can hold that up. It's got little roots coming from it. No tuber as yet, but that will quite quickly develop. Dahlias respond to feed well, so this is quite a rich potting mix with extra garden compost added. So that goes in there like that, and we'll do the others too. Firm it lightly, there's always a temptation to push too hard, just enough to stop it falling over. Right, these will go back in the greenhouse for a week or so because they've spent their entire lives there. And then when I see new growth, they will go outside into a cold frame where they will remain until September. Plant them out in the garden and lift them with all the other dahlias in November. But don't worry about this year's flowers, they're a bonus. What we're looking for is a nice big plant that will grow on next year and give us a good display. Now, that's just one of the many jobs I've got to get on with here at Long Widow. But we're off to Chatsworth now, because this year is the second RHS Chatsworth Flower Show. Carol and Joe and the team are there, ready to explore it and show us around. a breathtaking spot. You can't fail to be wowed by the sheer scale of it and impressive features like the famous rockery and the way the house feels as if it's floating on the canal pond. Chatsworth has been influencing garden design for centuries, but equally as important are the plants here, the trees, the flowers and the shrubs, which are just as inspiring. And that's what we'll be focusing on, practical planting ideas for your garden. Joe and I will be in the thick of the show gardens, looking at plants for architecture, for shade, for sunny patios, or to soften the edges. In fact, there are loads of ideas you can steal and try at home. And I'll be in my happy place. There are blossoms for your borders, climbers for your trellis, and bedding for your baskets. And the planting inspiration here in the floral marquee is almost as intoxicating as the scent from these lilies. First up, I'm looking for plants that add light to your borders. This garden's been in, and the Calamagrostis grasses, they represent the wheat in a field, so they're, they're laid out geometrically, but actually in a gardening context, they create a hedge, and they're a really lovely idea for a hedge. You can use them in straight lines, in circles, not just dotted through the borders to add plenty of height, and a sense of seclusion in here, which is exactly what they do. Another plant that adds height are the fabulous foxgloves here, those spires of flowers. 
This one's called Sugar Plum, and it's got soft pink flowers with a deep maroon center. They're absolutely beautiful. If you want foxgloves next year, you can sow the seed now because they're biennials and they'll flower at this time next year. Absolutely perfect. And the thalictrum towards the back looks fantastic against that dark fence. It's got a, a purple stem and a nice strong stem too, so it doesn't need staking. And it's beautiful in bud as it is now, and it's just about to open and get even frothier. So there's plants that can add plenty of height to your borders. I love this planting and it's got three fantastic plants which you could try at home. In the back here is Nautia Macedonica. It's part of the Scabious family, about a metre high and it will flower for about six months. Now it needs to be grown on a moist soil or it can wind up powdery mildew, that sort of white coating you see on the leaf surface, so nice moist soil. If you haven't got space for a plant of this height, then there's a more dwarfing cultivar called Mars Midget, about this tall, brilliant little plant. Just in front of it here is Valeriana officinalis, lovely see-through plant, and it's working brilliantly here at the front of the border, you can see through behind it, and we'll get about another sort of month or so of flower from it, it can then be cropped down to the ground, makes a nice tussock, and everything can be viewed behind it. And then finally over here is Persicaria red dragon. Now it's quite short at this time of year, but it will make these really scandent stems. And one way I love to use it is to plant it under evergreen shrubs that don't tend to have much interest later on in the season, things like camellias. And what it will do, it will make its way up through the shrub and give you these little sparks of colour in its foliage and then ultimately in its flowers. So a really useful garden plant. something to tell you. I'm in the floral marquee but I've got the blues. Not that there's anything melancholy or unhappy about it. Far from it. I'm enchanted by the beautiful blue hues of so many flowers in here. Most gardeners absolutely of all our flowers are blue. It's got this quality that no other colour has. This is a brand new delphinium that has yet unnamed but even within these flowers, there are several different kinds of blue. And I suppose delphiniums of all flowers are renowned for giving us this colour in our gardens. You've only to look at this stand with this multitude of different shades to know just what a valuable colour it is. This breathtaking display on Kevet garden plants is just surmounted by a wave of blue. It's the blue of blue Mechanopsis from the Himalayas. There are all manner of different varieties here. This particular one is Mechanopsis Lincoln. You can start it from seed. And once your plants are established, they should come up year after year after year, giving you these gorgeous big blue tissue paper poppies. This plant, on the other hand, is from a completely different place. It's a little Corydalis. It's called Mucronipetala and it's from the woodland floor in central China, in West Sichuan. But this is the very first time I've seen this one. And I think with these brilliant turquoise flowers, a color that's hardly ever seen in nature or in gardening, I think this is going to become a real winner. On Hopley's beautiful stand, this salvia really caught my eye. It's Salvia Grigii Blue Note, and it's sort of sprinkled with these vivid, deep, rich blue flowers. There's a lot of debate about whether or not it's hardy. Half hardy, I think, is probably it. But it's a perfect plant for a pot. You can move it around just where you want and protect it during the winter. But just to be on the safe side, why not take few cuttings. It's always a good insurance policy with salvias. All you need to do is detach little side shoots, preferably unflowered. Pull them down gently from the stem, neaten the heel up, take off the bottom leaves and put them around the edge of a pot of gritty compost. By the next spring you'll have well-rooted plants and they'll grow on to become something of this size. There's something about blue that's celestial, divine. Everybody's got room for blue in there. Every year the Floral Marquis has 
as a master grower and is to celebrate a specialist nursery. And this year is an alpine business with over 25 years of experience, a long history in the shows, and they also won a gold medal at Chelsea this year. Now, if you thought that alpines I love alpines. It's like candy. You just look in and it's a pick and mix of colour, foliage, textures. A lot of people ask what a, an alpine actually is. Its original heritage is when you look at a mountainscape and you can see the tree line just finishing above that tree line, that's your classic alpine. When you, you grow in these plants, it's finding the key of the growing habitat. And that is generally what we say is free draining. If you imagine yourself up in the mountain, it's absolutely scorching. You could fry an egg on the surface. If you take your finger, push it through the screen, a couple of centimetres down, it's moist and it's cool. And that's what you're aiming for. You're not aiming to bake the roots. There's always moisture there, but the free draining means that that moisture is always moving away. So gravity's pulling that away. If you're growing in pots, it's a very good idea to have a glazed ceramic pot. You need to add the drainage because it's non-porous but the glazed ceramic reflects the heat and it keeps it nice and cool in the root system and mimics its natural condition. So here we have a Linaria Neon Lights. It's perfect for growing in around pathways so that gravel area around your patio. It'll actually grow in anywhere in the garden, even in dappled shades. And the good thing with this, it flowers throughout the summer so it'll even go through the dry spell through July and August and continue into autumn. You have this nice silver foliage and the vibrant flowers. Now here you've got the sort of a shades of purple and it'll come in almost every colour of the rainbow and with that it just self seeds through. It takes light footfall and even if you do manage to kill this plant somehow it'll then self seed and the following year you'll just have a swathe. Looks delicate but very tough plant. So this is Saxifraga family. So in my hand is Saxifraga paniculata baldensis. It's a really tight foliage. As you can see, the crowns are very small. There's absolutely thousands of crowns in here. It works really well in very tight crevices where nothing else is growing. You may be sort of a dark courtyard. And so just in your wall, you can take a piece of this off and establish it in there. And because it's such a small crown, it'll slowly bulk out. And it doesn't need that much nutrients. But something like White Hills here with its larger crowns, that's actually going to take a bit more substrate so you can see it's actually growing directly in the container rather than up here in in the crevice and they thrive in all sorts of conditions so this is pulsatilla vulgaris that i've got in my hand here just the uh, pendula flowers here going straight up into the seed head and the good thing about this plant it grows in so many areas now here we're growing underneath the eucalyptus tree in dry shade and these plants thrive in this condition. And you can see these seed heads are just so dainty, but they come up on these erect stems and they're just magnificent. Just staying like this and then feathering later on in the year and they'll be still here in July. They can really structurally attractive. The two days before we turn up at a show, we have to then pick out all the planting for that show. It's no preparation involved that I can pre-pack anything. It is literally just chaos. So we just have to get there and work with what we have. This year, the RHS has invited us to Chatsworth as their master grower. We're actually putting a mini nursery into Chatsworth so we can educate as many people as possible because that's the thing for us. It's the passion of sharing the knowledge. And that's not all. We'll put on a full display. This is our most ambitious display that we've ever done in size and in just the, the variety of what we're, we're going to be displaying. And what you're hoping for is that when you turn up there, everything works. Your exhibit is absolutely beautiful tells the story of your nursery and then how to grow these plants. Yeah, so here we have everything from the pollen shed and seed cuttings and divisions. 
the, into the prop house here where everything grows on into the stock beds and then behind me here we have the full display just showcasing what the finished product looks like. It's beautifully laid out, it's absolutely stunning I have to say and your eye is drawn into details and how you put combinations together. I love that terracotta bowl over there. Run us through what you've got in there. So over here you have this classic Saxifraga white hill so with its pure innocence in the flower and then you've just got a wash of colour because of the greenhouse is creating a little bit of shade in the corner you've got the Councillor Arachnoidia Darcy's Velvet there with its richness in foliage and flower colour. People think alpines are just spring flowering but there's a longer season of interest isn't there? People are realising alpines are a necessity in the garden because you can get that early February flowering all the way through to November now. And Do you think alpines are the next big thing? Yes for sure because you can grow them in so many areas of the garden. So people realise now they've got rid of that archaic look at alpines that needs sort of that classic rock garden. Now they're just working in herbaceous borders, in containers on people's balconies. It's a plant for every situation. Luke, it's lovely to meet. Most of us enjoy the journey a plant takes from seed onto leaves and then finally flowering. But sometimes, just sometimes, having a plant that's going to look amazing straight away and the show is absolutely full of ideas that you can try at home. Talk about instant impact, this is Prunus cerula, this fantastic small garden tree. This is a multi-stemmed version and you can see this incredibly beautiful bark. Now, there's all sorts of ways you could use it in the garden. It could be great at the end of a vista, sitting alone in a lawn as a specimen or at the back of a mixed border with and herbaceous plants in front of it. Now this comes in at about £500, but there's a much more economic version. All you need to do is to buy three whips, three single stem plants, and they'll cost you about £70 in total. Put them all into the same planting pit, and you'll end up with a near instant impact multi-stemmed Prunus cerula. Topiary is a great way of getting wow right now into your garden is a brilliant example of that, it's the absolute classic. People get a little bit nervous about pruning topiary but I want to show you a technique that I've developed over the years which makes it really simple, dare I say nearly foolproof. Now I call it the hot cross bun technique and it can work for boxes or anything else you're topiarising. So to start with the idea is to cut a strip with your shears across the top, keep looking from overhead so you can see that you're getting perfect symmetry and then you cut a strip the other way so that's the hot cross bun and then the idea is once those strips now, you simply join them together, the crop between the two. You know, shows like this are full of inspiration with fantastic high-impact plants that you can try at home. So be bold, be brave, go out there and experiment. If you're looking for an abundance of colour, few plants can compete with the humble fuchsia. Buying these plants in full bloom does give you that splash of colour straight away. But to look after them, there's not too much need to do feed every four weeks or so to keep them producing those blooms. You keep deadheading, taking out the old flowers as they finish off. And then when it comes to late autumn and into winter, before the frosts, then move them into a cool glass house or a conservatory and they'll do really well. And then next summer you can bring them back outside and they'll give you another six months of fabulous colour. No matter what colour scheme you've got going on, there's bound to be a fuchsia that will suit your garden. Designer Chris Myers has created a garden here that represents fears is rapidly disappearing. We caught up with Chris in his remote home. But the thing is, over the last 50 years, the dales have changed. 97% of the wildflower meadows in the UK have gone. My garden at Chatsworth showcases the beauty of a Yorkshire Dales wildflower meadow, and I just hope that people will see that and go home with the message that they need to be protected and cherished in the future. Now when you look at these meadows, all you're seeing is grass. There are no wildflowers in there. By lacking wildflowers, the meadows are also lacking bees, bugs, butterflies and birds. Now the most important thing there is that the bees, bugs and butterflies are pollinators. And pollinators are what make other things grow. Without trees and other plants, the planet will die. But it's not all doom and gloom. Farmers and landowners in the Dales have been working to see a return of wildflower meadows.
By harvesting donor crops from existing hay meadows and spreading them on fields without any wildflowers, the farmers are actually encouraging the wildflowers to spread throughout the dales. The three top plants that I'm using in my wildflower meadow at Chatsworth are really the accent colours of a Yorkshire Dales wildflower meadow. You've got the purple, soft yet it stands out, of Wood Cranesville, the lovely sunny buttercup, shining back at us, we can all remember as a child sticking that under our chin, and then we've got the red clover which starts out life as quite a small, compact, vibrant red-pink ball that matures into a lovely soft pink globe. Another great species of wildflower and a really important one is the yellow rattle. And what's special about yellow rattle is it's a parasitic plant, it's parasitic to grass. So it actually digs into the grass roots and feeds off the grass plant, which weakens the grass and it allows all the other wildflowers to thrive. And there's actually some yellow rattle growing naturally in my meadow and I'm well chuffed about that because I've spent so much time and money trying to get the stuff. You might wonder how on earth I'm going to get this gorgeous lump of wildflower meadow to Chatsworth in one piece. You see, when we built it, we built it on individual strips of capillary matting, a little bit of meadow, some plug plants, and what's happened is, whilst it looks like it's all fused together, it's still in its individual strips. So when we set off to the show, you just simply lift a strip, and there we have it, our own wildflower jigsaw to build at Chatsworth. So whilst the meadow around me is really quite pretty, the plants that I'm growing down there certainly are not. These plants here are going in the cottage garden in front of my little cottage at Chatsworth. The cottage in my garden is very much inspired by the shape and form of the stables at home. And the idea is that whilst it's going to be a cottage garden, it's going to look like a very real cottage garden. In fact, I'm actually growing those plants in shallow trays of soil. And I'm doing that just to stress them out a little bit so they're not going to look like big, beautiful, blousy, typical show garden plants. I just hope the people look at them and see that the garden looks quite real. And I'm kind of hoping the judges get that too. I really hope that visitors come and see my garden and forget they're at a flower show and think that they've walked into a quiet little corner of the Yorkshire Dales. The only hope is that when the garden is finished, I can stand back and look at it and think, yes, I've done the Dales proud. Chris, you've done the Yorkshire Dales proud. Your garden is beautiful. You know, it's so nicely put together. You've got a silver, so do you think the judges got it? No, I don't think the judges got it, but that is my fault. There is so much going on in the Yorkshire Dales and I've tried to cram so much into this garden that I've written a brief about the garden and I've not put all those details in the brief. So I left the judges asking questions about the garden and if they're asking questions, they might be down. Normally in a show garden, you're looking for perfect plants. You know, they'll all be fed, beautifully pruned. This is a very different style, different look. So how easy is it to achieve that and how have you done it? I didn't want it to look like the Yorkshire Dales on steroids by using the finest plants, the luscious plants. I've used plants that are a bit scraggy. I've used plants that are maybe a little bit stressed, but by doing that, it's created a garden that looks real. A lot of people see your wildflower meadow and think, I'd, I'd love to turn my lawn into that. But there's a certain process you have to go through, isn't there, really? There is. The first thing you need to do is ensure you've got low fertility or you need to reduce your fertility. To reduce your fertility, it's maybe for a whole growing season, cut your grass, take the clippings out of the way, compost them, never let them break down into the ground where the meadow's going because that just feeds the ground. The other thing to do is sow your seeds at the right time. I find if you cut your grass they start to grow and things start to happen and then you can always pep it up with some plug plants in the spring but over, over a period of time you know the longer you go at it the better it'll get well chris it's lovely to meet you it's a great message it's a great garden thank you very much thank you Astrantias are a lovely group of plants they've got this old-fashioned air so it's a cottagey garden in recent years they've become extremely popular and they've been developed in all sorts of colour ranges. This is the original, the Strontium Major. And if you look at the flower closely, they've got this lovely ring of brats. And in the centre, these quivering little flowers, each one atop a 
a sort of filigree stem. So the whole thing quivers and shakes. Now, they belong to a family called APAC. It used to be called Alls. And this is the sort of thing we usually associate with that family. Same tiny flowers, but this time in a big plateau. You can see the similarity and at the same time you can see the difference. But it's these big bracts, these bold flowers, which make Astrantia such a useful plant. There are lots of different hybrids that have been developed during the past few years. One of them, Astrantia Roma, has rich pink flowers. And unlike most Astrantias, it's sterile. It doesn't set any seed, which means it continues to flower for ages and ages. One of the Astrantias that's become extremely fashionable recently are the dark red forms. They have crimson bracts, often quite dark stems, and the flowers are dark crimson too. Lots of them have specific names, but if you get one plant, you put it in your garden and you collect the seed in about September or so, it's really worth sowing them. They may germinate almost straight away. If they don't, shove them outside for the winter and that fertilisation, that cold, will get them to germinate. By April or May you'll have little seedlings and then you can prick them out, grow them on and many of them will be even better than the parents they came from. Whichever strantia you decide to grow, make sure that you cultivate it well. They love rich organic matter in the soil. Never let them dry out and they're great plants for clay soil. Remember, never grow them in splendid isolation. They're very sociable creatures. They love to be growing alongside other plants. Foxgloves and ferns, hostas, grasses, they really are brilliant plants. lots of fabulous things here in Chatsworth and of course plenty of plants that you can buy but if money was no object the one thing I would take with me my favorite thing would be this bonsai it's a maple forest in a pot and I've only got a small garden in London but I've always wanted a little bit of woodland so this is the solution imagine that I'm really enjoying the living laboratory here at the show. Instead of focusing on the aesthetics of plants, it's all about sustainability and the future. And behind me here is a brilliant example. This is known as aquaponics, and it's this fantastic closed system. So fish poo into the water just here, nutrify the water, which is then pumped all the way through these plants and back. So it's a completely closed system. What a fantastic, sustainable way of producing food for the future. If it was up to me, I'd choose this whole stand from Bluebell Arboretum and Nursery, but I can't. And of all the beautiful shrubs and trees here, I've got to go for this one. It's Cornus Cusa Mistatomi. She's a confection in pink. She should be deep pink, but she's faded a little bit. She's bone hardy, as are all named cultivars of Cornus Cusa. And these brats, rather than flowers, will keep going for ages and ages. Utterly breathtaking. We've had a fabulous couple of days here. Everyone's enjoying themselves and even the dogs are having a good time because at Chatsworth they're very welcome. But I've got a lot more to see. The show is still open until Sunday, so if you can get along to Chatsworth, do, and all the details can be found on our website. And the great thing about shows is that however many you go to, you always see something that inspires and inspires you. I remember going to Malvern some years ago and buying my first Mechanopsis. In fact, these are grown from seed, from those original ones. They do need cool, damp summer. They do need fairly cool down winters. They prefer acidic soil. And yet here they are, flowering with this astonishing blue. It's time to plant out courgettes. So 
get these in the ground that they should start producing in a few weeks time they're all the same variety gold rush and like all members of the cucurbit family they love rich soil and plenty of water so i'm putting them in a little bit of a depression so that that will hold more water so one here and this is the sort of spacing you want to be looking at I would normally give these a good soak, and I will do later, but it's just starting to spot with rain. And I've got a job that needs doing in the greenhouse, so I think I'll get on with that and then come back and water these when it's over. It's time to plant tomatoes. Now, I don't grow tomatoes outside anymore because blight is pretty endemic, but they do really well for me in the greenhouse. I've prepared this bed and you can see that it's got plenty of compost added in. Now, I'm gonna start with these, and this is Mave de Marche, which is a good all-rounder. Medium-sized, and just a really good, tasty tomato. So, I will plant these in a grid about eight inches apart, and I'm gonna support them with string. Just tie right at the base of the plant, loosely, because that, that's all we need to do, and then, a string comes up like this, and then a tie up to here. It doesn't have to be too taut, just enough to support the plant. And the beauty of this system is, when it grows, you simply twist it round the string. There's no tying in at all. When you plant tomatoes, Always bury them at least to the first pair of leaves, and that does two things. One, it anchors them and secures them, and two, they will grow roots from the stem. And therefore, they'll have better chance to feed and take up moisture and to anchor themselves firmly, because this will grow into a large plant, hopefully with big, heavy fruits. However, you may not have a bed in a greenhouse. You may not have a greenhouse. Uh, but you can still grow tomatoes. You can grow them in any kind of container. And of course, millions are grown in bags. However, I like to grow them in pots, particularly terracotta pots. They drain quicker. I find the tomatoes prefer that. I'm going to put a crock in the bottom. And then I've mixed up some compost. This is homemade. It's got a lot of garden compost in it. It's got some soil been sieved. It's got coir and sharp sand. So that's put this in okay this is costoluto ferrantina which is a lovely one of my favorites i'm not going to string these because one of the virtues of growing anything in a pot is you can move it around but it will need support so i'm going to have a row of pots there plants on this side and what i'm looking for is not quantity but quality which way of growing tomatoes produces the most delicious fruit? Now, with a small pot like that, you can grow tomatoes practically on a windowsill, certainly in a tiny, tiny garden. And this year, we are trying to look at as many different small gardens as we can. But I don't suppose many will come any smaller than the ones that Adam went to visit in Peckham in South London. You know, as a gardener, I love having a nose around other people's gardens. And away from the hustle and bustle of the inner city, beyond these gates are 46 terrace cottages, each with their own tiny little garden. Let's have a look, shall we? Welcome to a hidden horticultural gem in the heart of Peckham. you are flanked by these gorgeous miniature gardens that are full of character and variety. Looking around here, it's clear to see that there's a real community spirit in this secluded neighbourhood, bonded by the power of gardening. Sally Cowling is one of the residents here. This is an incredible stream. Give me an idea when it first started. Well, I gather it was before my time, but I gather it was about 1984, and one of the residents was a civil engineer and his wife was a really keen gardener and he laid the pathway along here and she started the you know the real sort of push to, to beautify the little plots. I mean I know all the gardens are small but 
Tell me how the biggest one is against the smallest one. Well, there is an enormous garden, clearly, which you would have noticed, which I think maybe is like three metres by two, which we think of as landed gentry <laughs> in this neck of the woods. And then the smallest, I think, are probably the ones in the, for the middle houses, like mine. But you've done well, though, haven't you? You've got, what, a metre by three? So, you know, <laughs> something so, along those lines. Yeah. I mean, even in your little space... You've got Clementis hidden behind the plum tree up there. It sort of gives me the sense of like a scene from Romeo and Juliet. Clementis Montana, you, you, yeah, yeah. you wouldn't think of putting that in a small no, space. No, no, but... no, but actually it is beautiful because it's gone all over the top of the plum tree. As you work along, each space has got this individual feeling to it. I've walked past spaces that feel architectural. You've got gardens that feel woodland in their setting. People don't stop at their boundaries either. They're out onto the path. But looking here, you know, I go into this garden and I think it feels a little bit... The moment I sit down, my eyes engage with the plants in a completely different way. But my head, I've got this rose and it smells fantastic, which makes it feel quite romantic. You start to look at the planting. We've got the herbs, we've got wallflowers, and they're good, hard-working plants. You could disappear from this garden for a couple of weeks, come back, and everything will be fine. But what I love about this street more than anything is, collectively, these gardens make an incredible wildlife corridor. This, can hear. this is a really simple collection of plants, but it demonstrates an awful lot about a small space. First of all, you look, that's an oak, and it's over 20 years old, grown in a pot. If you can grow an oak in a pot, surely you can grow anything. And then you look closer at the cotinus. Well, if I pick a book up, it'll tell me that this thing will get to 8, 9 foot by 8, 9 foot, you know? But you can grow in a small space in two ways, you know, if container-wise, if it gets pot bound, we just pot it on. But also, we can cut this one hard back to the ground cause so we can store it. And then moving across, we've got the texture of the fern and the tiny little leaf with the viola. So if you start putting plants together very foliage-driven, you know, and forget about the flowers a little bit, I know that's a little bit difficult, but you'll end up with a lot more interest right throughout the year. You know, for me as a designer, even in the tiniest of spaces, if I can, I will work water into the garden. I think this feature works really well. Simple, nice big deep pot, so that water will stay cool underneath. There's even fish swimming around in there. Iris is popping up, plus you've got the flower, and it's a lovely level for me to look at. And I'll stop and listen, and I've got the sound of water as well. So what they've done, which is quite clever, if I move back round to the door, which will be my main focal point, there's another feature just sat on that wall and that sound really pulls me towards it. You know, I think this little street proves that you don't need a big space to have a lovely little garden. They've got charm, they've got personality and for me that's what gardens should be about. But it does make you stop and wonder with gardens getting smaller in this country and the amount of houses that we're building, this possibly could be a fantastic template going forward. I have to say that that ability and desire to make something beautiful, regardless of size or shape, is certainly something we can all learn from. And we've been looking at small gardens, and we whittled those down to a short list of just five. And we've shown you all five over the last five weeks, but here's a chance to have a brief look at each one again. Mike Spezzano's Tropical Hideaway is designed as a room to be enjoyed all the year round. At just over 35 square meters, Mike has packed his space with dramatic exotics and with memories of his travels abroad. At just under 25 square meters, Chris and Rachel Wilkins use reclaimed bricks to create a courtyard with plants for both sun and shade. They also managed to find room for a bespoke greenhouse. Sarah Carter created a journey through her 36 square meter space, transforming a dull area of decking into a curving path with borders packed with plants. And her garden is also a haven for her family. A circular patio is the focus of Caroline Angel's garden, where she indulges her passion for a huge variety of plants packed into borders and containers, making the very most of her 25 square meter space. 
Finally, Zoe D'Souza's 18 square meter basement garden started out as a dull space devoid of sunlight, but now it's an extension of our home, filled with an eclectic mix of junk shop finds and even a fireplace. Now it's your chance to decide which one of those five is the winner. Voting begins immediately after the end of tonight's program at 9 o'clock and will remain open all weekend until 10 o'clock on Monday morning. That's the cutoff point. To cast your vote, go to www.bbc.co.uk slash Gardener'sWorld, where you will also find the privacy policy and terms and conditions. Now, as well as voting, here are some jobs you can do this weekend. Bye-bye.